OK, hi, everybody. So I learned a couple of things. One is. How to help your if you do a lot of Zoom meetings, how to tr help with your Zoom fatigue. And it was actually really interesting. Um, one is so when you're on a meeting like this is to try to hide your own face to try to so that you're not constantly looking at yourself. Um, we can try not to, but if your face is on the screen, you're going to be checking yourself out. Now, if you want to do a quick hair check, you go right ahead. But if you go onto your the view of a Zoom meeting, you can choose to hide yourself and that can be helpful in um, reducing some of the fatigue that we experience by being on all the time. Another thing that you can do is actually to change it to only speaker view. So I don't know what you're looking at right now, but I'm looking at a screen of um, you know 20, 20 little boxes. And I do that because I want to be able to see as many of you as I can, but you can also change it so that you're only actually seeing the person that is speaking. And that can also help you to reduce your Zoom or um, FaceTime fatigue. So that was just a little thing I learned this week. And um, I've been trying it out at least to try to hide myself because I don't really wanna look at myself all day long. Um, so that was one quick announcement that I had. And another one is that, so Nancy Duby, hi Nancy, you're here. And I hope that Irene is here. Um, not sure if she was able to join us today. But um, so I have Irene McMahon and Nancy Duby who are both working with me. They're working part-time and they're gonna be starting to take some phone calls. And yesterday, actually, you may have gotten a phone answered, my phone answered by Nancy. And I just wanna reiterate again, what I said last week, which was when you talk to Nancy or to Irene, that it's, it's just like talking to me. We are in constant communication with each other. It's just a way that I can maybe be off the phones for a little while. So. So please welcome them when you see them. Um, Irene, you're here. I'm gonna call on you really quick, Irene. Can you just say hello so people can see your face and um, hear your voice? Hi, everyone. Some, some of you I know, I see Jane and um, it's fun to be back for a short time. So hopefully I'll hear from you. Or maybe hopefully not, because you're gonna be calling about COVID cases. But this anyway, true. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being here. And one final announcement is that the MASN, so the Maine Association of School Nurses, is having their membership meeting directly following this meeting. So right at four o'clock. So just stay on the meeting. We'll take a quick break and um, then MASN will start their meeting at four. All right. Without further ado, I am going to make Sally. Hi, Sally, I see that you're on. I'm gonna make you a co-host in case you want to share your screen. Um, so Sally is working actually with the with DHHS and Maine CDC on all things testing for COVID. Um, and I'm gonna kind of let you introduce yourself, Sally, and kind of the goals of what we're doing here today. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Sally Weiss. Um, I'm the Director of Testing Operations um, under DHHS um, in the Commissioner's Office. And my role primarily is to support um, testing across the state um, with all the variety of providers and stakeholders in our communities, um, but also to help coordinate between departments um, at the government state level. So I work quite a bit with Department of Education and the CDC um, and the state lab, um, as well as many others. So I um, have met some of you before um, <laughs> under unfortunate circumstances, <laughs> um, but it's nice to see you again. Um, so I offered to provide um, a brief overview today of the Binax Now antigen card test. Um, so 
I believe most of you have received a survey kind of asking if you might be interested in utilizing this tool in your schools. Um, and Emily thought it might be helpful for um, you all to get a little more information around kind of what this looks like and what's involved. Um, and also allow an opportunity for you guys to ask any questions. Um, just for background, I do not have a clinical background. Um, that being said, I've participated in two educational sessions uh, offered through Abbott, which is the company that manufactures the, the test itself. And um, I've been provided some resources that I'll be using for the kind of general presentation today. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to answer most of your questions, but if I can't, I will take them down and get the answers to Emily and Nancy, and then they can share them with the group afterward. Any, any questions before we get started? Okay, let's see. So let me pull up my, I'm hoping this works. Always a good gamble, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Good. Okay, great. So as discussed, um, today we're going to be talking about the Abbott Binax Now COVID-19 AG card training. Um, and this is a presentation that Abbott put together. Um, so I'm going to be going through it. And some of it is repetitive. Um, um, just, but, you know, it's just the way the presentation is. Hey, Emily, are you admitting these people or should I be admitting them as well? Oh, I'll take care of that. Okay, great. I'm like, oh gosh, this is going to be good. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Great. I got it. Um, so I'm hoping you guys all can see this. I'm going to minimize myself. So um, the intended use for the Binax Now COVID-19 AG card is a lateral flow immunoassay intended for the qualitative detection of um, SARS-CoV-2 and a nasal swab collection from individuals who are suspected of having COVID-19 by their healthcare provider um, within the first seven days of symptom onset. Um, the Binax Now card does not differentiate between the SARS-CoV and the SARS-CoV-2. I did actually ask Avid about that. And while this particular test does not differentiate, there have been no instances um, of detecting SARS-CoV. Um, so antigen um, is generally detectable in nasal swabs um, during the acute phase of infection. Um, and positive results usually indicate presence of the viral antigens um, at a quantity that is detectable. So when we talk about PCR um, testing, which is the gold standard of COVID-19 testing, um, it is picking up the RNA of the virus at lower quantities, which is why it's really been used primarily and pretty effectively at picking up asymptomatic um, individuals. Uh, this test um, is really looking for the viral antigens um, that are have enough of a presence that are picked up by the specific test. Um, so obviously positive results do not rule out uh, bacterial infection or co-infection and likewise negative results don't rule out other infections and likely are related to another infection. So a little bit about this use. Um, this was approved under the emergency use authorization and um, through the FDA and it was approved for the use as I just described, which is for symptomatic individuals with symptom onset in the first seven days. Um, there has been some conversation um, nationally and even at the state level about how these potentially could be used 
um, outside of the emergency use authorization, which would be for asymptomatic screening. We just don't have enough information about that right now. So um, there are some pilot studies being conducted across the country. And as we get more information, um, hopefully we will learn a little bit more about how they might be able to use for more of like a daily screening of individuals who potentially may have been exposed. So um, tight test site obligations. Um, so it says notify relevant public health authorities on intent to run the test. Um, the intent would not be that schools would advise the CDC every time they decided to run a test on a um, child or student in their school or even a staff member. Rather, um, just, the, just the fact by requesting them and going through the process of training, um, you kind of are already notifying us of your use, um, intent to use. Um, we are also asking reporting of all results um, to healthcare providers. Um, so for schools, that may mean uh, calling that child's primary care doctor if they have one uh, noted and letting them know. Um, ensuring all operators are trained to perform and interpret the test. So again, this should be designated by a few people who are trained to use this test, and it shouldn't just be picked up by a lay person and uh, used. Um, that the test be used, per, used, be used per the manufacturer's insert, and um, that you just retain all records associated with the EUA. So um, this is a little bit of the product overview. Um, so again, this is a rapid lateral flow immunoassay for the qualitative detection of SARS-CoV-2. Um, this is for the point of care settings operating under a CLIA certificate of waiver or certificate of compliance or certificate of accreditation. It is a direct nasal swab and results visually read at 15 minutes. Results should not be read after 30 minutes. And it does not say this, but they should also not be read prior to the 15 minutes. So what's included? Um, so each box comes with 40 test cards, which are pre-packaged uh, uh, like you see here. Can you guys see my cursor? I'm wondering if I can create a cursor. Yes. Okay, so this is the what it looks like when it comes in the box. Um, and it comes with, this is the bigger box. And then you'll have 40 of these, 40 swabs. Each box comes with one uh, reagent, bottle of reagent. Um, and it come, this is what the card looks like when you open it up. Here is a plastic transport tube, which is an optional um, material. It is, does not come with the kit. Um, and I'll get to that later. Um, and then you have a positive control swab and a blank nasal swab for negative control, as well as the product insert. So storage and stability. Uh, kits should be stored between 2 and 30 degrees Celsius. So essentially, um, you know, room temperature. Uh, ensure all test components are at room temperature before use. Um, and they are stable until the expiration date uh, marked on the outer packaging. So quality control. Um, the card itself has built-in procedural controls. Um, in an untested Binax Now COVID-19 AG card, there will be a blue line present for the control line position, which is the internal procedural control. In a valid test, the blue line washes away. So when you first open up the box, the kit itself, the control line is blue, and then this is um, blank. And then in a valid test, the blue line washes away and a pink purple line appears, confirming that the sample has flued, flowed through the test tip and the reagents are working. The clearing of the background color from the result window is a negative, whoops, is a negative background control. 
and um, the background color in the window should be light pink to white within 15 minutes. The background color should not hinder reading of the test. So again, if the blue line is not present at the control line position prior to running the test, then the test should be thrown out and not used. Um, so laboratory practice suggests the use of positive and negative controls to ensure the test reagents are working, the test is correctly performed. Um, the, each card kit contains a positive control swab and a sterile swab that can be used as a negative control. Um, and these swabs will monitor the entire assay. So the recommendation is that um, when ever, with every time you receive a new shipment, so even if you receive, let's say 80 tests, so two boxes, you would want to do a negative control for one for each shipment, um, not necessarily each, each box. That's the recommendation by Abbott. And then the negative control would also want to be used every time you're uh, training a new operator. So again, required frequency with new shipments received, again, per shipment, not per box, and for untrained operators. So the nasal swab, yep, Good questions. Okay, um, the nasal swab collection, you're going to insert nasal swab into the first uh, nostril and you swirl it around about five times and then you remove it and you put it into the next nostril and you do the same five swirls in that uh, nostril. So it's a double swabbing of both nostrils and you wanna do five rotations with each nostril. So if immediate testing is not possible, you do not wanna return the nasal swab to the original packaging. Um, you wanna use the transport tube that I referenced earlier, which is a, an additional um, uh, item that you can order outside of the box. Um, a sample is only stable for about one hour prior to testing. Um, so I'm not sure if there's a huge use case for the transport tube. However, um, you could, I suppose, if you were going to collect a sample, um, perhaps out in a parking lot um, and All right, Sally, can you unmute yourself again? I, I just muted everybody, so, sorry. Okay, sorry. all right, okay. <laughs> um, so the transport tube may be helpful. I could imagine a situation, um, you know, not necessarily at a school, but if you were collecting a sample out in a parking lot or, um, you know, in someone's home, and then you were driving 10 minutes to someplace else to um, actually conduct the test. Uh, maybe the transport tube makes sense, but for the most part, the recommendation is that it's immediately following the nasal swab collection, you would conduct the full test. And so this is a little more information about the transport tube. So here is a little, I'm not sure if this is going to work. I have another. Um, let's see how I can do this. Um, Are you going to try to show that little video? Yeah, hold on. Can you guys see that? Yep. Can you all see that? This is yes, Nancy. Sure we can hear it. it. You just can't hear it. So um, it's just music. Um, but if you, I'm just trying to figure out how would I, Emily? Do you know how I would make sure that they can hear from my computer? 
Hold on. I, um, I'm playing it again. I don't know if maybe I just couldn't hear it. Okay. Well, it's just music. So if you can't hear it, you're not missing anything. Um, it's more of just a visual of what it looks like. Okay. So we'll just show you. Okay, let's get back to my ah, presentation. All right, so that just shows you kind of a brief, um, kind of what it looks like, because this picture is just not as pretty. Um, essentially, what you will do is once you've collected your sample, you will open the packaging and pull out the card and open it up and you will hold the um, reagent uh, bottle about a half an inch above the top hole, and you will put in six drops um, directly into that hole. And you wanna make sure that you hold it completely upright and not slanted. Um, you will insert nasal swab into the bottom hole and push it up until you can see it in the top hole. You rotate the nasal swab shaft three times, or uh, like Abbott, the Abbott education person said, you, you just basically wanna twirl it around um, so that the reagent um, gets, uh, covers the top of that swab there. Then there's, a, there's an adhesive here. You're just gonna pull that off and you're gonna go ahead and close the card and you're gonna let it lie flat. And that's where you would use a stopwatch or something on your phone um, for 15 minutes. And again, you do not wanna read the results if 30 minutes have passed without looking at it. And you do not wanna read results prior to 15 minutes. So it's really between 15 and 30 minutes, but 15 minutes is when you wanna read the results. Positive result has a pink, purple control line and a pink purple sample line and a negative result just has a pink purple control line. Again, these two lines at the top would be blue when you first open the card and as the reagent um, and the swab kind of passes through the top, this should wash away and turn purple, pink, pink or purple. And then if it's positive, you'll just see the, the second pink or purple line below. So again, this is what it looks like. The control line is blue. And what's kind of nice is they give you the instructions right here. So they kind of say six drops, top hole, inserts in the bottom hole to, till you see it here, twirl it three times, remove adhesive, close 15 minutes. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty self-explanatory. I'm not gonna go over that because that's basically repeating all the same information. Um, again, result is negative, 
Um, and then this would be indicative of a positive. And then these are invalid uh, results. So if, if you ran a test and um, you had I, any one of these results, then you would want to discard the test and um, or this card and repeat the test. Um, so one thing that it did come to mind as I was thinking about this for schools potentially is that all components of this test should be discarded as biohazard waste um, according to federal, state, and local regulatory requirements. And I was going to follow up with Emily and Nancy about that because I'm not sure what that may mean for a school setting. Um, usually it used to be, it used to be Sally, and that, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that we were considered household waste because we had such little bits of things that we might discard. I, I don't know if that's changed, but that's what OSHA told us at the beginning. Right, that's what it used to be. And, but I think that what they're saying with this testing is that this is, does need to be considered biohazard waste. Is that correct, Sally? Yes. So I know, for instance, biohazard waste needs to be um, discarded in like, you know, just having worked in healthcare for many years, um, biohazard waste generally wants to be placed in a um, secure lid trash can with a step kind of um, mechanism to open the basket and that the liner itself should be a red bag. Um, and then in terms of how that waste gets discarded through the school or the district, I am less clear about. So I think, frankly, probably Emily, Nancy, and I need to look into that and figure out how that would work. Um, this is Nancy Hoskins. Now, yeah. for the, those schools that do not have the red biohazard bags, um, when these kits come, is a red biohazard bag included? No, it, it probably wouldn't be included with the kit. Um, again, I don't know enough about, uh, frankly, how bags like that are acquired. And I'm guessing it's probably something that um, could be ordered or potentially even dispensed. Um, but I, I just, you know, whether it be through, uh, you know, DOE providing some some uh, resources on how those could be ordered. Um, they're not terribly hard to get. I think the bigger question is how will that biohazard waste then be disposed when it's ready to be disposed out of the school? And that's the part that I'm less clear about and need to get some need to get some answers on. Right. I think we'll have to go back to go back to that. Yeah, we'll come we back will. To that. <laughs> um, so again. This is again, just going through the same process. It's very repetitive and I apologize for that. Um, so I'm not even gonna go through it. And then this is some additional resources. This is the ordering information um, for the actual cards, the control, um, the control swab kits. So you can order additional control swabs. If for instance, you are in a district and perhaps you have 12 people that need to be trained as operators, then you'll likely need additional control swab kits to do that. Um, and the state does have extras, so we can work with DOE if there are situations like that. Um, and then again, the optional COVID-19 swab transport tube accessory pack, but I don't foresee schools necessarily needing these, but you never know. So. Um, and then there's a technical support line, which is available um, to all users of this test. And this is the Abbott technical support line, and they also have an email. Um, and additional resources. So they also have um, basically a website, which I'm wondering if I can just hold on here. So this is their this is their Binax Now COVID-19 AG card and Navica app set up and training. They've developed a whole web page um, with resources um, that include videos. These are kind of overview videos, but down here are the training videos and they're in modules. 
So it's getting started, how to do your quality control, your specimen collection and handling, patient individual test. You have something called the Navica administrative app. This is really for, I don't think this will be applicable, frankly, in many settings. Um, I think this is, when they were thinking about using this, they were thinking about using these for large employers. And a potential employee could have this app on their phone. And every day they go to their employer's, you know, uh, employee health, and they would get this test done. And um, I'm not sure if you saw at the top of the card, but each card has a little um, individual barcode that the app can scan and the results then go straight to the phone itself. And then you get kind of a, um, so, so an employee for instance could open up their app and then show uh, their employer or you know if they're about to fly on an airplane, they could show I'm negative. I just had a test and I'm negative. Um, Having had conversations with Abbott and um, the state, and frankly, um, I've been on some calls with the federal HHS, um, and they're looking to further develop this app to be more useful for like larger, um, for some different applications like schools or um, other types of settings, but it's just, it's not there yet. Um, but anyway, they, they do have all these modules here. And then in additional, they have all these helpful documents. So just the card product insert, um, each, um, each kit comes with um, some information. I think it's like a patient information handout. So again, if you, if you did conduct the test, um, you could actually provide that individual with like a like an information about they got tested for COVID two and what should they expect. Um, so those come with the, the box itself. So that's kind of a that's like a crash course in the Binax now. Um, and now I'm going to try to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> um, let's see. There we go. So, Sally, what the PPE is recommended, or does Abbott recommend certain PPE for someone conducting the test? So, they do not say what is recommended for PPE. I think the challenge is that some of these tests are being, um, Abbott is say, stating that these tests or the swabbing collection could happen self, like you can self swab. And in those instances, you're not going to necessarily, it, unless someone is right next to you, you you're not going to necessarily need somebody in full PPE right there. Um, it's not a uh, it's not a particulate generating um, process in terms of the collection itself. But I would say for a school setting, if you are test if you're yeah. swabbing a child. Um, I would say gown, mask, shield, or eye protection are all appropriate. And um, certainly donning and doffing um, fresh, at least gown and um, gloves between each test is, is critical. I know in the healthcare settings, um, eye protection or, eye sh or shields um, can be cleaned and hung. Um, and that's perfectly acceptable um, for preservation of PPE. And likewise, um, N95 masks and even surgical masks can be reused as long as, again, they're stored appropriately and donned and doffed the correct way. Um, I've seen people use like Tupperwares, like mini Tupperwares, where they can literally remove from behind and store and then wrap it around and then put it in a brown paper bag. That's, that's what's been recommended. Mm -hmm. so Any questions? The, there was another question about um, nasal drainage or bloody nasal drainage. Does it need to be cleaned before you swab? Swab, and I don't think you <laughs> would clean it, right? I mean, you would. You want the drainage there. That's the point. Right. right. That's, that's it's interesting. I think if you, this is. I mean, I was actually talking to somebody at Heddle about this, and I think 
if you have a, I mean, if you have a young student who is extremely mucousy and it's running down like on top of their lip, you're not going to want to swab that. I think it's just going to be too uh, mucousy. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to need the child to clear their nose somewhat, uh, pr just so that you can actually uh, collect a sample that isn't, um, you know, really heavily, uh, especially because you have to technically do both nostrils. I think that that could be really challenging. Um, I think you probably have to use a little bit of your judgment as to whether someone is too mucousy or too runny to, um, but, but Heddle Health Environmental Testing Laboratory did say in cases like that, a, an individual should try to clear some of their nose before, before being swabbed. And that wouldn't interrupt the, the value of the result. So I know that these are pretty new and there's tons of questions here, which is great. Um, I, yeah. I wanted to just say a um, couple really interesting things. So we, the state of Maine has already distributed these to our Department of Corrections. And so they've been, been used just in the past week at, um, at our state uh, prisons and our um, correction facilities. And so far, um, we've had, uh, I think, I think I when I spoke with um, the deputy commissioner, he said that they'd already used maybe like 11 or 12 of them on symptomatic staff and inmates. Um, and they'd already had two positive binaxes that were confirmed with PCRs positive. Mm -hmm. So um, it was interesting that they are already being in use. And so far, um, they seem to be generating um, some good results in terms of and how they're used for symptomatic screening. Um, there was also a new study that just came out by the leading infectious disease um, kind of, uh, um, what am I trying to say, uh, association. Um, and it was a study of, I think, 364 individuals who had the Binax. And um, the sensitivity on that re report was very good. So um, we're getting more and more data every day in terms of um, the efficacy of it picking up um, individuals truly who have it. So do you want me right. to, do you want to work through some of these questions, Emily? <laughs> what? Um, well, I, I think the one thing that's being asked um, is that, you know, it's best done in the first seven days of symptoms, which somebody's asking online, right? Yes. Sally? So, yep. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. Yep. Um, yes. So... In the cases that they're being used at DOC, these, these individuals are both staff and they're at work and all of a sudden they have a headache. Um, one individual had a headache, a runny nose, and had a sudden loss of taste. Uh, they were tested within 30 minutes or an hour of those symptoms starting and it was positive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other individual, I believe, had a headache and a sore throat and a runny nose and maybe a low grade fever also also developed during the work day right. and, and right. access the testing. So it's really like really the, the, the best case is the right at that crux of right when they're starting to not feel good. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little bit so, about the waiver? Um, I see. Go ahead. Ability or like the, um or the false positives. And I know that that's a, something that we don't know a lot about the false, how often are we going to get false positives? Um, but how does it compare with other rapid tests as well? So um, based on um, the EUA information, the sensitivity and specificity of this, I think was listed as quite good. Um, I wanna say it was like 96, 98%? 98.2. So. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Nancy. I was like, I can't pull it off the top of my head right at this moment. But um, I will say that the newest study that just came out today by the Infectious Disease Association mm -hmm. actually um, 
at a slightly lower sensitivity than that, but it was mm -hmm. still, according to Dr. Shaw and Dr. Sears, um, extremely, it, it, very good and better yeah. than the Abbott ID now, yeah. the CLIA, um, mm -hmm. there's another, um, Sophia Quidel and some of the other antigen tests that are on the market. So yeah, it's we're still coming in at 96 to 97%. So yeah. So yeah. it's performing better than those tests. Right. So that was really encouraging. Right. When is a PCR recommended? Yeah, so yes. I think right now, because we're still learning a lot about um, these tests. So what we're kind of thinking about is a PCR would be recommended um, if, if there were a positive Binax, um, we would recommend that that child probably follow up with their primary care and receive a PCR for confirmation. That being said, the CDC is gonna treat that positive as a positive um, and will go through all the pieces around uh, contact tracing and reaching out to that family. Um, I will say that there, there was significant concern about the false positives, but just what I'm seeing with DOC and frankly, this new study, I, I'm feeling more confident that the likelihood of false positives maybe, maybe, maybe may not be as big of a concern as we initially thought. Um, and, and the negative predictive value of this test is actually very good. So that's actually the most reassuring. So if you have someone who's symptomatic and they get it and it's negative, you almost can certainly, it, it, the negative predictive value of this test is 99.8%. So if, if you have a child who is symptomatic or a staff member symptomatic and you do this test and it's negative, you can feel pretty solid about that response. Um, that's as good as a PCR, frankly, a negative value. Um, I think another time a PCR may be recommended is um, for those instances where you know of somebody who has had a direct exposure uh, to COVID-19. Hopefully they're not in your school because they're identified as a close contact and in quarantine. <laughs> but in those instances, because we're not just rolling these out to schools, we're rolling them out much broader. So in instances where you have somebody who is identified as a close contact, they've had direct contact with someone who's positive, and they are acutely symptomatic, and that result is negative, we're saying you should probably get a PCR just to make sure. Um, even though we know we feel confident about the negative predictive value, it's just you know, for that, just for that uh, comfort of knowing for sure that, you know, you're not missing something. Um, let's see. So a CLIA, so the CLIA waiver is something that um, a school, if they're not currently um, holding a CLIA waiver, they would have to apply for it. Um, I've been actually working on, I, I, I don't know if I sent it to Emily and Nancy, maybe I did last night. I sent, I've been creating a, like basically a one page directions on mm -hmm. how to fill out the CLIA waiver form. It's pretty easy. It's $180 to get a CLIA waiver. It's a, it, the application itself, I want to say is six or eight pages, but the portions that you have to complete are- nine nine pages, but the portions you have to complete <laughs> is four. are, four are about pages. four pages. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I put together a one pager that takes you through step by step by step. Like, what are they asking for? What does that mean? What should you put in? Um, and right now the CLIA waiver process at the state. So once it's submitted the application, they're turning around approvals and waiver certifications in one to two days. Mm -hmm. So it's very quick um, if that's something that the school district wants to pursue. Right, um, one of the questions Sally was, is it per school a CLIA waiver or can a district apply for a CLIA waiver and it would cover all of their schools? So that's a good question. My <laughs> understanding, yeah, my understanding is that it would be the district 
and not the school. Because mm -hmm. my understanding is CLIA waivers can be extended to other facilities um, under the same waiver. So for instance, um, it's kind of crazy, but even a healthcare system could extend its CLIA waiver to a school if they wanted to. Um, so if it, so based on that, I, I think what it is is that it would really be the district. And you would probably want to list the primary uh, facility or organization address and information. And then under that, whatever schools fit under that umbrella, that's the school, that's, those are the individuals. And I think it's important to also identify who your operators are going to be within your district. You know, you don't, you really don't want, um, you know, 40 people being able to like pull out these tests and just run them on whomever they feel like they want to at the moment. Um, at that, at the same time, it probably makes sense to have a couple people per school so that if somebody is occupied or not in, um, there's still access to testing if, if needed. Can you do a quick 15 right. second, what is a CLIA waiver? Just because people that work in schools have yeah. never, maybe never even heard of CLIA waivers. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I've been in healthcare for nine years and I'm not sure I understand a CLIA waiver. I mean, so a CLIA waiver is a, is a laboratory um, certification. And um, so for really complex labs like the state lab or a really complex lab at Maine Health where they're doing uh, tissue samples and things like that, they would not have a CLIA waiver. They would have a CLIA certification and they might even be CLIA accredited, meaning that they operate at a very high level as a lab. Mm -hmm. It's really a level of um, process, procedure, uh, maintaining certain temperatures. It's, it's, it's really um, quality it's control, quality control. So the reason why a CLIA waiver is basically you're saying we want to do point of care testing and that's when a CLIA waiver is, a, is appropriate. So for instance, if you want to do finger sticks um, in your school, and I know maybe some schools are doing this, um, you technically should probably have a CLIA waiver to be doing a point of care um, uh, sugar reading. Um, Likewise, a pregnancy test or something like that. So if you're a facility and you're going to be doing a lot of point of care testing, you would have a CLIA waiver. Um, most, um, it's, it, it, and the reason why it's a CLIA waiver is because basically we're saying we're going to waive those requirements because really what you're doing is, is a simple, uh, quick test that doesn't have a lot of risk associated with it in so terms of There are risk. certain tests, right, that are that have that say you can do these with a CLIA waiver. You don't have exactly. to be a certified lab. You can do them exactly. with a CLIA waiver. Exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah. And that's ex that being said, I just wanted to let you guys know that there are groups that are working right now nationally to kind of petition CMS to see if they can lift the CLIA waiver requirement tied to this test which would then allow people to distribute them to individuals at home. Um, so for instance, one of the use ideas is if you had a close contact, so let's say you had a positive case in your school and um, you had a teacher who was identified as a close contact, you could distribute 14 tests to that teacher and they could test themselves every morning. Um, and so there's lots of use cases around that, but right now we can't do that because of that CLIA waiver piece, yeah. but they're trying to figure out how to make them um, almost more distributed like a pregnancy test. Like why can't people just do these at home? Um, especially if, if you as a teacher woke up that morning, or maybe you're not even a close contact, maybe you just have some and woke up and you're like, gee, I'm supposed to go to school today, but I kind of feel not good and I'm just gonna do this test and okay, it's negative. So I feel like I can go to school. I mean, it's that kind of stuff, producing call outs and hope, you know, um, preventing kind of staffing shortages, things like that due to just maybe normal colds. Um, so I'm hoping that in the next few months that actually might happen, but we'll see. 
So there a lot of questions are coming in about, um, and I don't know if it's time to talk about it here or not, or later, but you know, are they would these tests be used in a school setting? How how are we looking at we think these tests will be used in a school setting? I guess is what I'll ask. Is some are asking, you know, is this going to be part of the whole? We know there's a positive case. Now we got to test a whole bunch of other kids because they were close contacts or staff, or, you know, is this, how, how are we envisioning this for them, the school nurses to use? Yeah, so um, it's a, this is a big question, right? Um, I think, I, I think what I can tell you is Rhode Island is already using these in schools. Um, so they've already figured out how to use them. I think the best use case for this, and frankly, what, what we envisioned was, you know, just from my own experience is it's 10 o'clock and you get the kid who shows up in your office and they've got a sore throat and a runny nose and it just came on and you call the parents and the kiddo is going home no matter what. But then the parents are like, should I get them tested? And I don't know, should we get them tested? You call, da, da, da. So what we envisioned was a situation where maybe a school would want to offer testing to that family. Um, and maybe it's just to rule it out and say, you know, it's negative. It's likely just a cold. It doesn't mean they can return, but, you know, it, it, you know, you don't necessarily need to go try to find a place to get a PCR test. Um, so that was kind of, and same thing with teachers and staff. So, I mean, interesting and it's kind of anecdotal, but if I recall, I believe that, that um, you know, Massabesic that had some cases in their middle school, I believe several of those students presented in the school day with symptoms. Um, so I think it didn't really change the outcome to what happened, but perhaps had they been able to test right then and there, um, it just would have sped up the process versus those students going home. And I mean, 24, 48, you know, 72 hours really before the school knew that those were, those kiddos were infected. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, people are still going to school, close contacts and all. Um, so it may be a way that you could jump on a potential, uh, case sooner. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that those are two primary use cases that we've talked about. Um, is it perfect? No. It, you know, I mean, I can certainly understand that for some districts, this may not be something they want to do or even get in the middle of. And, and I think that's, that's totally reasonable. Um, at the same time, it's a tool. And, um, you know, we're trying to uh, you know, unfortunately, COVID-19 isn't going away anytime soon. So um, how can we, you know, develop our tools and our toolkit and what makes the most sense and, and how can we use them smartly? So I think that that's kind of our, our thought process. Sure. Is that and helpful? parent consent forms? Thank you, Sally. Pa parent consent forms. Consent to test. Yeah, so um, I have worked on developing some generic draft consent forms that schools could use. Um, so if a school decided to opt in and get the CLIA waiver and do this test and offer this test to students, um, they may want to provide some communication to their district that they are going to be having these tests available. Um, and if that is the case, they can go ahead and collect consent ahead of time, written consent. So I've drafted a couple different versions of the consent form, which I've shared with Emily and Nancy. Um, and certainly it's something that schools could use or they could use their own consent form if they have something already on file. The other form that I had created was a letter, like a generic letter um, about you know, what kind of test it was. And then the other document I created was a demographic information. So as you're Part of the reporting requirements, um, which I can get into a little bit, but one of the other forms is kind of, it's a demographic form. And so it's, again, it would go with a consent if you sent it out to parents. And it would include, um, you know, the name of the child, points of contact, but then it also includes some of the information that the CDC wants 
when you're reporting any testing conducted, such as race, gender, ethnicity, um, as well as I think the demographic form may also have their primary care physician. And the consent form says like, we would wanna reach out to your primary care physician if we did a test and it was positive, we would wanna alert your primary care. And so that demographic form actually has that PCP name and telephone number. So that essentially if you're doing the test, you have the consent already, you have the demographic form already, and then you can use the demographic form to help with the reporting, which is a really quick, lab, port, it's like a web-based portal that you would create an account, the school would can create an account, and it literally takes 15 seconds to enter in a test result. It's super fast, um, but it does ask for some of those core demographic information because um, that's the information the CDC tracks. Um, and then you would have the PCP information there for, for any potential positives. You could give that PCP a call right away and let them know. Um, so that was kind of what we talked about. Yeah. So knowing that we're just about out of time, Sally, and I, yeah. I know that there's so many, there's so many questions about, um, about the process and unknowns at this point. Um, I'm going to ask you one last thing and, and then we'll wrap up for today and, and know that we'll, we'll just have to have other conversations with all of a larger group of nurses that are, that continue to show interest. And, um, but my, my one question is for you, Sally, is do we have an idea of a timeline for schools? For I know that we, um, we asked for the interest from schools. Do we have an idea of how long it will actually be before we are putting them in the hands of school staff? That's, I know that's a loaded question, but. No, it's actually not. I mean, I, so what I can tell you is I'm developing a website that's, I've got a, I've got a sandbox version so far that has all the Abbott resources and materials and training guides on that same site. This is through the CDC. It's going to have the information for registering for the reporting piece and how that looks. Um, and then in terms of, I mean, we have, we have thousands of these tests already at the state and we are distributing them already to Department of Corrections, EMS. So I think it's really a matter, frankly, of really solidifying those, those schools that really do want to participate. And then, um, you know, my working with you, Emily and Nancy, to, to get these forms and everything and get all the training and resources and everything kind of set. And then figuring out our distribution. I think I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we would distribute or how many we would distribute. So I think that that's probably a bigger question of um, trying to figure out that piece. But I would say certainly, uh, it's certainly launchable within several weeks if that, if that was how quickly we wanted to go. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. And I'm happy to jump on again if, if more questions come up or if it would be helpful uh, later on as I'm we get further along. Okay. I'm sure we will do that. Thanks, thanks Sally. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So. So that's it for this portion. Um, thank you for all of your questions. And I, I will um, take the questions out of the chat and make sure that we I share those with Sally and we get everything um, thinking about everything that you guys are thinking about. Okay, the end. Um, so I'm gonna shift gears. I'm going to pause. We're, I've been recording this session, so I'm gonna stop that.